This Black History Month, we salute legends of the past, people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, Majeska Simpkins, to name just a few. They created a legacy that gives each of us voices. So News 19 is kicking off what we hope will be a nod to our future. It's a series of reports called A Seat at the Table, where we will amplify the voices of black people affecting change in our community today. Well, each has a name that isn't necessarily widely known, but they worked, struggled, and persisted to create a space for themselves and help others. You might say they were looking for a seat at society's table, and where they found none, they created a space for themselves. As we introduce you to these trailblazers, our intent is to spark greater understanding and conversation about why representation and inclusion matters. As we begin, we're going to start off with Alana Simmons Grant whose Hate Won't Win movement began after her grandfather was killed in a racially motivated attack at a Charleston church five years ago. This is a seat at the table. How have you been since then? Well, uh, I'll just kind of start with where I was in 2015. Um, prior to you know, all of this professionally, I was an educator. Um, it was the night before the last day of school for me, and I remember getting a call from my father saying that there had been a shooting in Charleston. I got home, we turned on the news, and I mean, there it was right there on CNN and every other news station, you know, Charleston Church Massacre, eight victims, one, critically injured. Knowing my grandfather, he's always at church. So it, it was, you know, a fair assumption to believe that he was there. One of the things I remember praying was that my grandfather was the injured one. And that's like, how crazy is that to even consider, you know, pray like, God, please let my granddaddy be the one that's injured and not one of the eight that were, was murdered. We woke up today and the heart and soul of South Carolina was broken. After you've been the news, you watch it differently. I remember, you know, seeing them wheel a victim out, you know, from the church into the ambulance. And I mean, it was just like on a reel. Like I saw it every time I turned on the TV and I, I fell asleep watching the news. The next morning was probably six o'clock. The coroner had confirmed with my grandmother that my grandfather was indeed there. He was the injured victim, but that he passed after suffering several gunshot wounds. We hold sacred the places where people come and practice their faiths. It was definitely a dark time because, you know, we're grieving the loss of my grandfather. We're thrown into like the media of all things. Like, you know, all these news stations were at my grandfather's house when we got there. We're like, what are you guys doing here? Yeah, it was, it was complete chaos and then also introduced on a really rough introduction to um, the judicial system from a personal standpoint. There was this hesitancy on whether or not the state should charge him or the federal government should charge him because the state was unable, you know, they could charge him with a whole lot of things but they couldn't charge him with a hate crime and the federal government could. That really stalled our process, which for me personally stalled a lot of things like my career. All rise. So at the bond Thank hearing of Dylan Roof, when I was present, you know, you know, the judge said everybody would have a chance to address him in that moment. I told me my, it was me and my dad and my brother. I was like, we're not saying anything. We don't have anything to say. We don't have anything good to say anyway. So that, that was my original, you know, mindset going in there. And I'm a person of faith. And I remember Miss Nadine Collier, she stood up. She was in such physical pain. She lost her mother at the Lance. Family members had to help her to stand up, to even walk to the podium. The first words she uttered were, we forgive you. And I was so humbled. Like, I felt this big in that moment, not because of anything else going on, but that she had, with the lack of physical strength, that she had enough emotional strength to get up and do something that nobody saw coming. I just want to know, to you, to you, I forgive you. you. Took something very precious away from me. I will never talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you. And 
have mercy on your soul. In that moment, it was a true testament to the kind of people we lost that day. Like these were the kind of people who raised people who could in their darkest moments still exude strength. And I was just amazed by that to the point where um, when my family was um, offered the turn to speak, you know, I, I said to, um, to Dylan Roof, I said, you know, although my grandfather died at the hands of hate, he lived in love and he preached love and his legacy will be love, so hate won't win. Your name, ma'am? Alana Simmons. Thank you, Ms. Simmons, for being here. Your statement, please. Although my grandfather and the other victims died at the hands of hate, this is proof Everyone's plea for your soul is proof that they, they lived in love and their legacies will live in love. So hate won't win. And I just want to thank the courts for making sure that hate doesn't win. Everything that we do, we do out of either love or fear. For me, the choice to, to forgive was motivated out of the fear of descending into what he was and then out of the love of Christ. It's not a forgive and forget situation. No, what he did should absolutely be, be held accountable for and um, suffer the consequences. That's just how I, that's what I believe. But the way the love of Christ is, God forgives everybody for everything if they ask. Now he didn't ask, so that's on him. But what I believe is that, you know, for me, I have to make the choice that I'm not going to turn into this. I'm not going to let what he did determine how I operate. I don't want to give anybody that kind of power over me. Before we got out the courtroom, you know, all these people were calling and texting me and saying, oh, hate won't win. I'm like, how do they know? Like, God must have talk, talked to everybody. Um, but then I saw that it was, uh, it was on the news and I was like, oh, okay. From that, you know, this hashtag was going all over social media. It was just everywhere. And, and I decided, okay, here's now a platform. Let's add a call to action to it. We challenge people to go out, show an act of love to someone who is different from them um, and you know, post it to their social media accounts with the hashtag hate won't win. And the purpose of that was to shed some positivity on my timeline. You know, all I kept seeing were the you know, mug shots of Dylan Roof and it literally sickened me. So I, I wanted to see something different. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. At Senator Pinckney's funeral, they sat with each family individually and they asked us, you know, is there anything that we could do for you? And, um, you know, President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama, they spoke about how encouraged they were by our families and, and the same with the Bidens. And, you know, I said, well, we have this hashtag if you want to participate. And, and we, you know, I didn't think he would do it, but we were, uh, you know, at dinner afterwards and one of our friends said, hey, isn't this your hashtag and your t-shirt? And I'm like, yeah, it is. And it just kind of took off from there. Before 2015, you didn't hear about hate crimes or racism in the context that you hear about it now. It was a very antiquated subject, and we talked about it in February, because February was Black History Month. And now it's more of an ongoing conversation, uh, which is one of the things that, despite how tragic this situation was, one of the things that helps me reconcile with what actually happened, more people are are more open to having this kind of conversation with uh, more receptive ears. For me, it's a very 
kind of comprehensive, this is how we rid racism. I think the one thing, the first thing would be being on a collective page of racism is bad. <laughs> um, because that that is kind of still where we are trying to get, you know, the majority of people on the page, you know, this is bad. Education, I think, plays a huge portion um, to it. I'm from a very progressive school district and even still things like racism and discrimination, like the pictures are literally in black and white. It took my grandfather dying for me to understand, wait a minute, my grandmother had to take a literacy test to vote. This is, and she's still alive and kicking. This is not that far or that long ago. And so if, if she had to take a literacy test to vote, the people administering the literacy, literacy test to, for her to vote are also still alive. So we have to think about it in the sense of, okay, this is not ancient history. This is something that is very real to people, people that we come in contact with every day. And just that level of perspective really um, helped me to understand how to message this, this subject matter when, when I go out to, to speak to different audiences. One of the things that I hate is waste. And you know, my grandfather got to live out a full life, but what I would have hated was for his life to have felt like it was wasted just because it was so devalued in his death. And that is why this work is so important to me because it gives me the opportunity at my you know, leisure, sometimes not at my leisure, to, to engage in what I believe would make his life more meaningful as we go along. Doing the Hate Won't Win challenge on social media was something that helped me to feel like his life was more meaningful because it, it inspired strangers that he never would have met otherwise. And even when I, I'm simply recognized for the work that I done, you know, grandparents are just so proud, you know, of everything that you do. So um, it, it could be something minimal, but you know, being um, acknowledged by, you know, the King Center, for example. I, I was awarded their Angel Award that was um, named after Coretta Scott King for young leaders who are, who are doing things in the Civil Rights Movement. And that is something, you know, that I know my grandfather would have been over the moon excited about. For me personally, like just even thinking about how my personal life has changed, like I'm now a permanent resident of South Carolina. I met my husband through this tragedy. You know, we now have a baby. I now work for the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs, which I had not even known existed such a commission. I know that had my grandfather not died, I would be in Virginia teaching music in the classroom. Absolutely fine with that, but now I have the opportunity to teach people in a different way. One of the things that I have as a constant reminder in our office now is my grandfather's Bible um, that he had with him that night. And in it is like all his sermons and he wrote them all out because he was so anti-computer. But um, I have that as a reminder to kind of center me in why, in my why. You know, I have a ton of leadership positions in the communities and responsibilities, and I have a lot of things kind of also going on in my mind that I want to do. And sometimes all of that gets to, um, it becomes overwhelming when you think about all the things that you want to do and that you need to do and, and that people want you to do. And I kind of keep that as a reminder for me and a reminder for my family of, you know, how we even became to be. I never would have met my husband. He was at my grandfather's funeral. I never would have met him any other day. And he's like the best thing that ever happened to me. I wouldn't have my son if I didn't meet my husband. So it's almost like the silver lining, I guess, in the tragedy for me personally and for my household. I do need that reminder of why we're here, what we're doing, and just keeping me grounded in my motives of being a good person, whether I'm out being a, a realtor, whether I'm out speaking on um, what we could do to end racism, or whether I'm cooking dinner <laughs> for my family because that's one of the things that I love to do. My baby just turned eight months old, and I've been married now for this year to be three years, but that is my primary role now, especially, you know, that we're home due to COVID. So balancing that with what I do with work has been um, 
delicate, but <laughs> certainly uh, I'm glad to be able to have the opportunity to spend more time with my husband, more time with my son. In my professional capacity, um, right now I am a project manager for the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs, and we are an agency that um, collects data on ethnic minority communities and um, turn that into programs um, for all the ethnic minority communities in the state um, to help uh, decrease the disparity of wealth. It gives me not only an opportunity to work with the African American community, but the Hispanic Latino community, the Asian American Pacific Islander community, the Native American community, small businesses. I um, mean, it really kind of encompasses like things that I'm passionate about that I didn't even know there was a career lane for. I am also a full-time realtor with Excel Real Estate. I love that as well uh, because I uh, have the opportunity to help people build wealth. And most of my buyers and sellers have been first time home buyers and first time home sellers. That has been really important because it's like I'm, I'm helping people start something. I'm helping people to lay a foundation. And then being able to do it for a black owned brokerage um, is also like, again, didn't see a lot of those where I was from. Outside of that, I am the uh, former immediate vice president to the Columbia Urban League Young Professionals. I'm on the United Way Education Council. I am on the Elizabeth City State University Foundation Board of Directors. Those are probably the top three that I have going on because I did cut some back after I had a baby because it was just too much. I just like to be able to use my gifts or my talents or my abilities or whatever they are in that season to um, help people. I'm grateful to be able to have the opportunity to do those things and I'm really grateful that people um, want to hear or want you know my participation in these things. You've basically created a seat at the table. What drives you to do that? One of the things that like I say I value is good-natured people regardless of their position whether they're the president of a university or whether they're the custodian at that same university. To me your legacy and your influence comes out in your character not in your line of work. I like to make sure that at the center of all of that, that my, my motive is always to be a good person and to let my good natured character shine through that so that people aren't necessarily attracted to the accomplishments behind me or the accomplishments behind my name, but more so the way in which I carry that.